today's webinar is nothing but Q&A. And so um, we've asked for the last week or so for people to submit questions, and we've got a ton of great questions submitted from Mark and Greg. And so without further ado, let me introduce uh, Mark Graven and Greg Jacobson. So one of the first questions that we received was specifically for, for Greg. And Greg, the question is, what made you realize that a system like Kinexus was needed in a hospital environment? How did you start the company? Yeah, so <clears throat> great question. Back in 2005 was when I really started um, becoming obsessed, if you will, with continuous improvement. I had um, started my residency and transitioned to a faculty membership at Vanderbilt. Um, I'm a night owl, so I was doing night shifts. And if you haven't noticed, the administration doesn't show up in the emergency department at 2 a.m. And so it was being introduced to process improvement concepts for the first time. I talk often about Mizaki and Mai's book, Kaizen. If you haven't read it, it is a great first book to, to get you on the right track to determining the knowledge you need to to really start doing continuous improvement almost immediately. And I realized, okay, so we have now two emergency departments. We've got this adult department. We've got this pediatric department. We're running a 24-7, 365 day. We have a whole bunch of specialists, right? I mean, even the people answering the phones, moving patients, the doctors, the nurses, the tech, everyone is really a specialist in what they do. But that whole mind chair is just being left in, in the front line. You know, there's no um, way to engage and connect all these people to surface these things and start working through them. So at that time, we were really starting to see the emergence of web-based applications and how fundamentally technology was, was changing. And I think in many ways can truly enhance communication. Mm -hmm. And so that was the, the hypothesis. Could we build a system that would actually help change behavior and help promote behaviors, not only from leadership, but help promote a habit in an organization to identify um, opportunities and then to evaluate them and complete them? That's where the, the genesis all started. You know, and how so, can we improve the emergency department? So just to be clear, you you built Kinexus really to use on your own. Right, right. No, I, I was an ER doc. I never, if you would have told me 10 years ago when I first started doing this that you're, oh, you'll, you'll actually be a CEO of a company um, in, in 10 years from now, not only will you be a CEO of a company, it'll be a software company, and you'll be helping people in healthcare and outside of healthcare. I would have told you you were smoking crap, but um, <laughs> yeah, so I became obsessed with, hey, how do you solve the problem that I was trying to solve? How do you make this emergency department better? So, and then I stumbled across, you know, well, we need to build some technology to help facilitate that communication. And then I realized, wow, developing technology is really hard and um, doing it homegrown is not going to solve the problem. So that's when I realized, okay, really solve this problem. You need to, you know, found a technology company that their whole mission in life is to help spread continuous improvement. Great. So Mark, the next question that came in um, was for you. What prompted you to shift your focus from automotive manufacturing into healthcare? Yeah, you know, it was, uh, it's funny how that happened. Uh, you know, I spent the first 10 years of my career in manufacturing. Uh, my wife and I were living in Phoenix uh, up until 2005. I was working for a big manufacturing company there, and I still thought my career was going to be in, uh, in, in manufacturing and leadership and lean manufacturing. Didn't expect to get involved in uh, a startup you know, company like Kinexus, but uh, my wife took a new job that meant we needed to move uh, to Texas. That put me on the job market, and I got a call from a recruiter, Johnson & Johnson, and so it was kind of a matter of right place, right time, and the circumstances of being willing to try something different. And you know, back in 2005, I didn't know if working with, uh, with hospitals was gonna be kind of a temporary detour or a career change. You know, I figured, like, you know, with a lot of things, what's the worst that could happen? You know, I would probably learn a lot along the way. And, uh, you know, 10 years later, you know, still very much focused on healthcare. So uh, lucky or, you know, just kind of happened to have that opportunity. Well, we're glad you are. So, so the next question is actually kind of a follow-up to that. What what differences do you see in implementing improvement in healthcare versus non-healthcare environments? Well, I mean, I think I think you know temp, the short answer to that is you know, well, you know lean is lean. You know the principles and the approach and the philosophy are very transferable. Uh, 
I mean, one advantage that healthcare has is just the sense of passion and purpose and mission that everybody has. People like Greg and the doctors, nurses, everybody in the hospital. There's a really strong sense of calling, and it, it's you know uh, you try to rally people around that in a way that I think it, you couldn't really do in manufacturing. Maybe there's some manufacturing companies where people really believe in the product and what the company stands for. But for a lot of people, it's it's a job, and that's okay. And lean is more about kind of the rational approach. Where in healthcare, it, it it's it can be very emotional in, in, in a good way. I think a challenge in healthcare is just um, often the starting point is one where there hasn't been a focus on continuous improvement. There hasn't been a focus on looking at the details of healthcare operations. So I think a lot of times healthcare has taken lots of really smart, passionate, well-intended people, kind of thrown them in, into a department and so well, it'll all figure itself out from an operations standpoint. And so a lot of what we're trying to do with lean in healthcare is, uh, you know, I think a lot of times trying to create some basic stability and have kind of calm out the chaos and the problems for patients and staff. So then we've got a fighting chance to improve on top of that. I think that's one difference in healthcare. It's hard to generalize, but um, I think sometimes just the level of chaos and frustration is really high in healthcare, unfortunately. Do, do you think that the... Um the tactics are different in how people go about implementing cultures of continuous improvement, or are they relatively the same? I mean, I think it's pretty universal. I mean, maybe I'll bounce it back to Greg. The work you were doing at Vanderbilt in the emergency department, you know, when I read, when I met you, when I read your paper, I mean, you know, it's all universal stuff. Mm-hmm. People want to do good work. Uh, they want to be heard. They want to make things better. Um, I, I, I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty universal. Yeah, I, I, just to follow up with that, I'm surprised at, at truly how universal it is. We were focusing on healthcare and we had non-healthcare companies keep reaching out to us um, and say, hey, why, why are you all about healthcare? You guys are solving this problem like no one else is. We want to use your solution in our company. And we kind of thought about it and said, okay, well, what would we need to do to, to make it non-healthcare? It was surprising how little in the product we had to change. Which to make a couple fields configurable to be, you know, instead of patient, it was customer. And what's amazing is to see the applicability um, and the uh, transference of knowledge. A lot of our customers, especially at our last user conference, um, uh, we're just amazed at how Apple, well, for example, a you know, semiconductor company, uh, Corvo is one of our customers. Well, they're a 24-7 shop, right? That the same type of problems that they have an emergency department has. And so um, I think it, to me, that's exciting because the, the more you can simplify and kind of take out static, the, the more you're probably answering um, and getting to a fundamental truth. And so if you apply these principles and they, they, they really work anywhere, if they're applied in the right way, you probably know you're doing something right. And, and, and I think you know, one thing I would reflect upon after getting manufacturing and healthcare and seeing continuous improvement taking place in other types of settings, there, there's a barrier where I think sometimes people misinterpret they misunderstand, they hear about lean, they hear about Toyota, and they say, well, wait a minute, a hospital is not a factory. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, of course. You know, we, uh, an architecture firm is not a factory. And, and people misunderstand, they think, well, lean is about a better way of building cars, when lean is really just about designing work, solving problems, managing people. Uh, the philosophy of it is, is transferable. I think, unfortunately, sometimes... Uh, people get to, uh, people sometimes uh, tune out or they oh they hear manufacturing and they, they stop listening or stop mm-hmm. learning so there can be a challenge that I think both embrace how a different type of organization is different um, and, and try to engage them and, and maybe talk less about we need to be like Toyota and talk mm-hmm. more about hey let's solve problems that matter exactly great so so let's ask the next question. Um, we've all heard it before. I think it's a fairly common theme. 
that Lean is anti-technology, but um, Kinexus is a technology company. So Greg, let's start with you. What what do you see and what do you hear from people about Lean being anti-technology and sure. what advantages would you communicate to using a system right. to help manage well, things? Well, first of all, Lean is not anti-technology, right? Lean is anti-throwing technology at a problem because it doesn't address the fact that the problem is rooted in a process issue, okay? So if you, I mean, you hear the stories about how the you know, Japanese came over to the U.S. in the 50s to look at this, you know, manufacturing engine that, that, that the U.S. was, and they came back in the, in the 80s um, after they had started um, embarking on their continuous improvement journey, and those factories looked almost identical to the way they did in the 50s. But if you went over to Japan and looked at their factories, they had some of the most sophisticated technology um, that was being used in manufacturing of the day. So um, lean is not anti-technology. What, what you have to understand is what is the problem you're trying to solve and does technology provide a solution that can't be found in other places? And so if you, if you talk to us, you know, there's, there's certain things that just simply can't scale on paper, right? You, you can't connect, you know, 5,000 people with a sheet of paper. And so there's certain things that we're really focused on. Collaboration is one of them. Visibility is another. Uh, measuring impact, making sure that there's a consistent way that's done. And those are where the true core areas of Kinexus are solving for people. Um, the, the areas that, that technology needs to stay out of, um, and, and, and I think we're, we try to do a really good job of this, is is the explosion that happens when people are engaged, right? It's that there's something magical about interacting. And I really don't care if the interaction is via an email because you've got someone that works at a night and another person works in a day, um, it, or whether it's occurring um, all in a room. But there is a, a phenomenon in human nature that one plus one equals three, and we need to recognize that. And so... Um, uh, it, you know, I was uh, kind of bouncing around through several different things, but the biggest thing is lean is not anti-technology. <laughs> Matt, yeah, let, let me just jump in real quick on that. I think a lot of this lean is anti-technology idea comes from the, the 1980s and, and 90s, or when you had a lot of manufacturing companies really trying to rely on software for forecasting and production scheduling and execution. And Toyota has, you know, Kanban and supermarkets and um, other methodologies they use that at the time were very, very uh, analog and physical, and they weren't relying on MRP or ERP systems to drive every detail of the factory. And that, you know, there, there, there's a more um, there's more nuance to it than somehow saying Toyota is anti-technology. They use a lot of software and technology. Um, but you know, I think the lean perspective would say, like you were saying, Greg, you know, technology is not a silver bullet. I think there's a related theme around the idea of you know, just don't automate the waste. I've seen that in a lot of hospital laboratories and other settings. Uh, automating the waste is uh, worse than trying to actually improve the process and try to eliminate as much of that waste as you can. So use, using technology in a way as Jeff Leiker, the book The Toyota Way says, technology that supports your people and your processes, well-tested technology, reliable technology. Great. Okay, so I'm going to ask the next two questions, and I'm going to expect really brief answers. I think these might be the two most important questions that we had submitted. C. Um, <laughs> you, well, so to both of you, what is your favorite dinosaur, <laughs> and what was your dream job as a kid? You did say ask us anything. <laughs> um, wow, I, I wasn't prepared for this. Um, I, I'll go. My favorite dinosaur is my four-year-old daughter <laughs> because um, oftentimes she will make sounds that sound like a dinosaur when she doesn't want to do things. Um, and uh, my dream job, I, 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 there was some part of me that knew I was always going to be a doctor, so that's probably uh, my dream job. So. Mark? I, boy, dinosaurs. <laughs> uh, I don't know which one, but 
you know, th- you know, people think of dinosaurs as being slow and plodding, and I'm sure there were dinosaurs that were fast and nimble and could change direction quickly. Oh, well done. Velociraptors, Mark. That's the word you're looking for. <laughs> there we go. All right. Yeah. Uh, Alinoraptor. <laughs> Alinosaurus. Yeah. <laughs> um, dream job for me, well, uh, through elementary school and even through middle school, uh, my dream job was actually I wanted to be a uh, baseball writer. Um, mm-hmm. A friend of mine uh, in the elementary school, his dad got to travel with the Detroit Tigers and write about every game and go to every game and was friends with the players. And to, like, to me, I thought that was, I loved baseball. I thought that was a really cool job. And that, that's where maybe I don't, I've always liked writing. So even though I became an engineer, um, I've been able to write, so I guess that was some foreshadowing there. Cool. All right, so we got we have one that's a little bit more specific. Um, one of our uh, one of our clients wrote in, and, and they are heading up a reinvigoration of continuous improvement efforts, and mostly they are dealing with business processes such as order entry and and payment processing and things like that. And and the question is, do you guys have any specific advice? on the types of pitfalls that they might encounter when they're trying to improve office processes? Well, I can take a stab at that. I, I would nuance the question by saying with regard to office processes, I think it, you're going to use the same approach regardless of the process. And the, the thing that we found the most successful is, um, one, you have to start with why. Why are we doing this? We're doing this actually to make your job easier. Okay. And, um, and then the next follow up is I always think the best way to get someone to just take that first step with continuous improvement is just to elicit what frustrates them at work. You know, when you're trying to um, do whatever transaction in your office that you're doing, where are they kind of going, oh, you know, that this always frustrates me. I, I just, whatever that is, I don't know. When I click this button, this happens. Or when I go over here, that happens. Or, you know, when someone puts an order in, I always have to call them back and it's just a waste of time. And if you start with why, and then you start with what frustrates you, we want to make your job easier. You're all of a sudden that the, the Guarantee the floodgates will open. We haven't seen it not happen. That would be my approach. Yeah, and I, I, mean, I think that, that's an important piece. I think some of the reasons why, I would start with the question, what problem are we trying to solve? So there's problems that, as you were saying, Greg, that affect the staff. You also have to start by looking at the customer. How do we need to perform better for our customers? What frustrates our customers? How do we better deliver value and quality to them? And I, and I think a pitfall to avoid is... Uh, trying to copy lean tools or lean methods. So you might see in a factory, um, people have shared toolboxes, and so those toolboxes have been have been fivesque and organized, and there's tape outlines or foam outlines uh, for everything. I think it would be a mistake to go into an office setting and say, "Okay, everybody, put tape around everything that's on your desk." Mm. Because I don't think that solves the compelling problem, and that. It, that, that, that happens out there and people get irritated and now you're disengaging them instead of getting them involved yeah. and solving things that matter. Great kindergarten project though. <laughs> so, so it kind of leads to the next question that I highlighted. Um, you know, everyone, you guys brought up uh, Kaizen by Mazaki Amai and everyone seems to have their core set of books that they right. read in order to learn about lean, which, which I think can sometimes lead to some copycat situations, but what are some of the key points that you guys have learned or that you would communicate with the audience that maybe they wouldn't find in a book? Oh, that wouldn't. Mark, do you want to? Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's so many books out there. There's so many, uh, you know, really excellent books, uh, not just about lean healthcare, but about lean in general. Um, I mean, let me, I mean, so there's, there's, there's a lot of truth out there in those books. Maybe this is a slightly different question. This is what comes to mind. My concern is more about what's sometimes in books that might not be really accurate about lean. Um, you know, for example, I mean, sometimes you'll see a book that says, 
this is a pet peeve of mine. Um, but yeah, lean is about speed and Six Sigma is for quality. And like, I don't think that's, that, that, you know, that, that's not true. So mm -hmm. I get concerned sometimes when people read something in a book that they then go and repeat and teach others. And, well, I, I don't know what the source of truth is for a statement like that. So I think mm -hmm. that's the thing to be careful about sometimes. What, what's a fact versus what's an opinion? Uh, I'm going to answer the question slightly different. And Mark gave me the answer when he was talking about things that are in lean books that are wrong. To me, I'm most influenced when I find lean not in the lean literature. And so to me, there, there are three key pieces of work that as a continuous improvement expert, you should um, read and watch videos on and probably read again, because I think that, that they, they sum up the social and the business psychology that's necessary to, to know. And I, I think it's probably better to know fewer things really well than to know a whole bunch of things not very well. Right, so um, don't go out and get 50 lean books. Go out and just pick one or two and just know those really well. But, so these are the three books. Start With Why by Simon Sinek. That, that is gonna be your lead opener on how you're going to introduce these concepts as you're spreading it in different departments. The Power of Habit, and I always butcher his name, so we'll just share that. Um, the Power of Habit. Because essentially, I'm sorry. It's Charles Duhigg or Duhigg. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Because <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> yeah. um, that's really explaining the fundamental way that you're going to create the discipline necessary to do this type of work. And then Daniel Pink's Drive explains how the inherent um, drive in people, the, the intrinsic drive of people is why people are going to engage in this process. And they don't mention lean anywhere in those three books. They don't mention process improvement anywhere in those three books directly. But understanding that what we're really doing, because the, I mean, at the end of the day, the problem-solving techniques, they can, be, they can be learned. I mean, that's, that's not rocket science, if you will. What's, what's really the hard part is that you're doing individual psychology and organizational psychology because you're trying to change the hearts and the minds of the people of your company. That would be... And I'll just add one other thought like in terms of lead books. I, I would encourage people, I like your point, Greg, about choose a couple. I would choose one that's relatively current, like the Toyota Way or Toyota Kata. I would choose one that's old. I would, shoot, I would pick a book either by Taiyi Shiono or Shigeo Shingo. Because if you read something old, something new, you're going to get different flavors of the same thing. And, for example, you're, it would be undeniable to see that lean is a quality improvement method. Six Sigma is great for improving quality, but lean has a lot to contribute and, and offer there. And then the third thing I would recommend, you know, especially if people like Daniel Pink to drive, I would read something by or about W. Edwards Deming because there's a lot of overlap uh, around motivation and intrinsic motivation and the dangers of rewards. But Dr. Deming was also very much an influence on Toyota and uh, a lean culture, if you will. And just to finish with something old and something new, and because Mark won't probably mention his own book, I do believe Lean Hospital is something blue. It has a little blue... Highlight. So you can do something old in there, something old, something new, something. Uh, it's a blue cover. There you go. All right. So that if you're in specifically in healthcare, that's a great, um, a great resource as well. Okay, great. So so let's go to the next question. So one came in. I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit, but um, what would your advice be for someone trying to introduce lean into an established company, but one that does does not do continuous improvement today. So there's an established culture, but there's not a culture of lean. And how do we introduce that into the organization? Mark, you wanna start with that? Sure, so I mean, I think there's a couple things. One, I think when, if there's not a culture of continuous improvement, we, I think we'd start by asking why. When we talk about the reasons why, why would it be important to have a culture of continuous improvement? But we should understand why we don't have that. And sometimes organizations, I think, unfairly blame the employees. 
how do we get the employees to speak up? Well, I don't know if that was, you know, the, the bottleneck I don't think was ever a lack of ideas, but we right. need to think what have leaders done in the past to discourage people from speaking up or to discourage taking action or discouraging people from being able to try and test ideas without 100% certainty that they're going to be successful. So I think you know we need to understand some of the history and the current situations. And I think the second point I'd make is a lot of times people talk about we, we need culture change. We need to transform the organization. We need a new culture. I think you need to understand the current state of the culture. It's not all bad in any organization. What are the parts of the culture that we need to strengthen and build upon? And what are the elements we need to change? So one example might be, yeah, in our culture, we always look to the managers or executives to give us answers. Or managers and executives have insisted in a top-down way, they're the only ones who have answers. So if that's been the culture, recognize that and you know, admitting there's a problem maybe is the first step to solving that problem. Yeah. So, Mark, let me let me follow up on that. Do you think it's the same challenge if the organization has really low morale, or do you think there's kind of a different set of steps if you're dealing with a low morale situation? Yeah. So I think back to um, General Motors 20 years ago. I was in a very low morale situation. We got a new plant manager, and he, I mean, he's, he's had to spend a lot of time tr trying to build trust. Right. He was going to come in and tell the plant, hey, I worked at Numi, I learned from Toyota, we're going to change things. He, he was out in the quote-unquote Gemba, he was out walking the shop floor. I saw him, you know, I was out there a lot, and, and he was really, he was building relationships with people. And that's something previous plant manager hadn't done. He was listening, he was letting people vent, he was trying to... Uh, do a little bit of teaching, but I mean, I think there's a minimum amount of trust that's necessary uh, for any of this to work. And, and and sometimes the early steps, I think, have nothing to do with lean methods, and it's really about relationships and trust and, and trying to find some sort of common ground that you can move forward on. Man, such a great point. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about people, right? right. It's not about anything else that we do. Um, Greg, let, let's ask this one to you. How would you uh, give someone advice on making their lean program sustainable? We hear too many stories of, you know, we tried, we asked, and, and, and then it just fell apart. Right. So what we're talking about is habit. And we'll go back to power of habit. If we understand the habit loop, then, then there's a cue, a routine, and then a reward, right? So you have to have the reward. If you don't have the reward, the next time the cue comes up, you won't do the routine. It's that cycle. And so really focusing on small improvements is the way to create that habit loop really quickly, right? So if you are going to start with a two and a half, three year project, well, your reward is going to take two to three years to get to. So you're not going to create the habit. Aside from the fact that Business is changing so fast today that if you're working on a project that you started three years ago, just stop it <laughs> and, and take a look around and figure out what are the, the, the current problems. But if you focus on small incremental change, um, first of all, I always like to say, well, what does innovation look like at the microscopic level? Yeah. Looks like continuous improvement. <laughs> you know, we see a new product from Apple. You know how long they've been doing okay. continuous improvement on that before they just show it to you? It just voila, looks in, looks like innovation just because you haven't seen the 3,000 iterative steps to get to that part. And so I think if you are really focusing on small incremental improvements, you'll create that habit. And, and that's why we hear a lot of organizations that are really successful that are creating that sustainable um, culture, uh, doing things like either a daily meeting or a weekly meeting or a bi-weekly meeting, it's because you're just s simply trying to create that habit. And then the, the other thing I would um, remind people of is you have to always be repeating your why, right? Because think about your organization. There, there's unfortunately going to be turnover in every organization, right? So if you have 10% turnover, then everyone's going to change in the next you know five to 10 years, let's say, okay, statistically speaking. And so you're constantly, there's new people coming in, right? 
and there's going to be um, this constant you know, need. And, and, then, and then if you have a new leader coming in, that really accelerates things because if the leader's not on board, then you've really lost ground. So there's this constant, and that's what the goal of the continuous improvement or process improvement or operational excellence, whatever that department is, their, their role isn't to go do the improvement work, it's to go coach and to go be the cheerleaders and to go remind people and to refocus them and to get them back on track because improving, I mean, it, it isn't easy. Right. You know, you have to do a little bit of it every day. Hey, Mark, let, let's switch it up to you. What are some of the pitfalls? I'm sorry, let me add one. Oh, sure. Sorry. So um, it's funny, I think, you know, the more you learn about lean, the, the more you realize, um, yeah, there are lessons to learn from other organizations, but at some point, everybody has to figure it out themselves because every mm -hmm. organization is different in some way. And, and lean is less about knowing the answer versus figuring it out over time. And so if there's a question that asks, how do we sustain lean? I think there's two ways you look at it. One is to ask, well, why is it not sustaining or why would it not sustain? understand those causes and address those very specific causes. And then I think the other way to look at it is maybe you, you need to first figure out how to sustain small changes. Forget about a lean program or how do we sustain a culture of continuous improvement. Get smaller and ask how do we sustain that change? How do we sustain the changes we made in a rapid improvement event? A lot of it comes down to, again, you could ask why did they not sustain? And it's really more about uh, you know, trying to figure out how do we better engage people, how do we get them to participate, how do we uh, make sure we're solving problems that matter. I think things like that help with the sustainment of the challenge. And, and, and I'm, I'm sorry, but Mark did give, us the, give me the instruction that it's better that we answer the question well. So I'm going to just I'm gonna add one other thing, and, and it wouldn't be a real conversation with me or a webinar um, unless I brought the spurs in some way. Okay, so um, you know the Spurs brought on a, 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 a new all-star to their team, um, Aldridge, and Aldridge is a fundamentally different um, type of player than 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 had been on the team. And so you don't see the Spurs just simply doing the same thing; they're relearning their process. And I think that that really ties into what Mark is saying: that if you understand some of the basic principles and then figure out how is that going to work in our company and then recognize that that might and will likely continue to adjust over time because if you get stuck in some old way well there's there's different people there's a different constitution so you can't just say oh well this is the only you know system to play basketball in or this is the only way that you could possibly do continuous improvement you have to kind of recognize if you will that um, companies are, are people they're just a you know group of people that are all working in, in, in line and, and with the same direction. And, um, and it's going to manifest itself in lots of different ways. But if you look at all those different manifestations, you're going to see some themes on the ones that are really successful, right? It, they're doing something that's simple. Everyone can engage in. They're doing it in a disciplined way. And they're doing it consistent throughout the organization not identical, not, it's not a copy and paste, it's a copy and improve, but it's consistent enough where there can be collaboration and shared knowledge across that organization. All right, now I think Mark and I are probably done with that. That was a great question. So, <laughs> so, so the next question actually has one of those kind of technical terms in it, uh -oh. um, bottom up. Uh -oh. and, and the question is, you know, lean is bottom up, but how do we get our executives and our supervisors and our middle managers, the top of the organization, mm -hmm. to buy in to lean. I, I, I know what Mark's first point is going to be. <laughs> lean is not only bottom up, <laughs> but like, go, go ahead, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, that, we, we, we're both so anxious to make that point. Uh, as I learned you know, first, I heard you know, from, uh, I think John Shook makes this point really well when he talks about his experience at Toyota. That lean is both top down and bottom up. So it's not just this aimless, delegated, hey, you're all empowered, go do whatever you want. Kumbaya. <laughs> and it's certainly not the top down, directive, oppressive, command control kind of environment either. It's a blend. 
and those roles that have to be played all around. Yeah, I mean that that that's the question was how do we get top? How do we get the yeah? Okay, how do we I'll get the, the second half? So I think yeah, Mark answered the first part of that perfect. I think that the second part of that is 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 we. The, we, we talk about this a lot, right? The continuous improvement cycle, the, the, the capture, implement, and measure, share, right? Um, the measure part is to make sure everyone understands what the benefit is, right? And so I think it's, there's twofold to leadership, um, making sure leadership kind of understands this. One is have them have a very easy and visible way to see the benefit of the continuous improvement efforts at the organization, right? So if they're, isn't a constant communication on what's the ROI, talk in their language, what's the ROI of this energy that you're expending, they're not going to focus on it. Um, and then secondly, getting them to understand, hey, you set out a strategic direction. These are the five areas, the three areas, the seven areas you want your, you know, your boat to row in. Okay, so you, you could just take the oars and row it yourself and good luck and you're going to be rowing a boat with a thousand people in it with two oars. Or you can say, wait a minute, I'm just going to give guidance that this is the direction we all want to go, guys, and then let everyone take their own set and start moving the boat in the right direction. So it's kind of saying, do you want one person solving this problem or do you want a thousand people solving this problem? And I mean, obviously the, the answer is well, we'd love a thousand people to solve the problem if they all know what's the problem that needs to be solved. So, so, Mark, let's. What direction, if we're, we're going to try to all row the boat together, what direction does the boat need to go? And I, mean, I think, you know, yeah, ROI is of interest to executives, but I think you started to touch on it. There's this need for a balanced set of objectives. Um, I learned back in the auto industry, and it applies, I think, in the healthcare, of this focus on safety, quality, mm -hmm. delivery, or access, or waiting times, cost, and employee morale. It's not always all about ROI. And so I think that's part of the conundrum with lean. It's hard for people to relearn a new habit. But the old habit was evaluate everything based off of ROI. Then I think the second challenge is, and I don't know if there's, I don't know an answer to this, I mean, to, to get executives to change some of their habits and embrace lean philosophies and a lean culture. So one of, one of my favorite books it's written by a number of different Toyota employees from Kentucky. It's called Toyota by Toyota. Chapter one of the book is about, it's the, the main theme is about leading with humility. Mm. Point one of Jeffrey Liker's The Toyota Way, summation of Toyota's approach. Point one is take a long-term focus and make decisions based on the long-term at the expense of the short-term. So you might have executives this is a million dollar, billion dollar question. Executives, they say, yeah, I want ROI, I want results. Mm -hmm. But they say, well, I want, I'm going to suddenly be more humble and take a long-term perspective that the organizations have often been uh, arrogant, short-term focused. How do you, how do you change that and develop new habits? Yeah, and for clarification, I use the word ROI, I'm talking about every kind of yeah. R, right? That can take the form in satisfaction, which equates to retention, which equates to customer loyalty, safety, which equates to humans' lives. I mean, their bodies, you know, both um, physical and, and psychological. So, uh, yeah, definitely. So, so Mark, you work directly with with customers, with clients. What are some of the things that you would recommend to help leaders to transition to become that coach that we want them to be? It's hard to coach something if you can't do it yourself. So I've been involved in different efforts to try to um, teach and coach people on problem-solving methodologies um, of different forms. And I think you know, executives need to roll up their sleeves and get involved. They need to solve some problems to do Kaizen or to do root cause analysis. They need to do some of that themselves so that they can understand, hey, this isn't easy. And don't just kind of browbeat people into saying you all need to understand root causes. It starts, the most change starts with you looking in the mirror. And I think being able to learn by doing, not just theory of lean or continuous improvement, but to actually get some practice and getting coached by, by somebody experienced then builds capability for those executives or middle managers 
to coach others in the organization. I think I think too many executives kind of misframe lean as saying, oh, they, they, you know, this is what, what our employees, our employees need to start behaving differently. Like, well, it really kind of, it, it all starts at the top. Lead by example. So this one's a little, um, a little different that came in. Uh, the question is, how do you take notes during a lecture or a webinar or video in a lean way? Any advice on how somebody could take their notes in a lean way? Interesting. I have one stab at that. I don't have a, <laughs> never thought about it, but I know we are really focused on process. Ironically, no. Um, here at Kinex, right? We're always trying to figure out, um, I mean, we practice what we preach, right? We have checklists for our webinars. We have been working on the sales process now for two years together. We're just constantly focused on how do we make it more efficient? How do we um, streamline things? How do we take out waste? And so we, over the last couple of years, had taken notes in several different ways. And what we ended up finding out was um, actually taking the note directly in our CRM tool, not jotting it down on a sheet of paper and then transcribing it, not, not dictating it and then sending it to someone, um, which, of course, I was a doctor. That was my first <laughs> notion. I'll just dictate a note and someone will write it out. And <laughs> people in the software world was like, you do what? <laughs> um, but actually, you know, try to figure out where is that note going to reside at the end. And, and so that was just an example of that. I don't know if that's what the question had in mind. But. Well, my, my thought on that would be, um, yeah, I don't know what would make something you know, around note taking lean or not. I mean, I, I think there's a general question that gets asked sometimes: is is it lean to do such and such? Is it mm -hmm. is it lean to have a, a discharge lounge for patients who are waiting to come out of the hospital? Well, what are the lean principles being used or violated? And I think at some point you say, well, is it better? Does it work? Let's try it. Let's see if it's better. So I would encourage experimentation with, with different ways of taking notes. But the, the one thing I've tried or I've noticed in the past, if you're at a big conference, I'm going to be at the Lean Startup Conference again next week. Um, when I've attended that before, you've got a room full of a um, thousand people. Everyone's got an iPad or a laptop out, and they're all kind of simultaneously taking notes on the exact same things. And so part of me looks and says, well, so look at the trade-off. Part of me says that looks like duplicative, wasted mm -hmm. effort. Mm -hmm. And so I've experimented with saying, hey, let's all share a Google Doc. And so we all don't have to type the exact same things. We can see what others are writing. and mm -hmm. There could be some, we, we might reduce that waste of motion, if you will. But then others have challenged that and said, well, maybe the act of note-taking helps us recall what's going on. Right. So that's not wasted motion. That means each individual is better processing and better remembering what they're hearing. And then others would say, and I think there's science to this, we learn, we, rec we re remember more when we write it down with a pen mm -hmm. than when we type with our fingers. And I, I don't mm -hmm. know why that is, but there would be something instead for close the screens and write. Maybe it's because we're not multitasking with Twitter and email. Well, and, and I'll, I'll add even a little, I know I'm not supposed to answer, but I'll add a little to this. My grandfather used to always say that if you spent two minutes at the end of every session and and took notes on your notes, recap mm -hmm. your notes, that you would uh, you would save time in the long run because ninety percent of your notes is going to be superfluous and right, right. and unnecessary. And if you would just spend two minutes afterward recapping them, I think you'd get more from it. Yeah. Smart, smart so, man. Yeah, instead of feeling the need to basically do a transcription to be listening more, and processing, and summarizing that. that that might work better too. So we, we've got a time for maybe a couple more. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if we shouldn't pull our end on cord and see where we've been in presentation mode, haven't seen our, um, haven't seen our go to meeting panel. Um, we've got four questions that, that came in, okay. and again, just to recap, you know, we've got questions that we won't be able to answer at the time here, but we will answer questions either individually or in some public format, we'll, we'll share that with the individuals who ask the questions. So here, here's one, and I'm, I'm reminded of uh, last week at our conference when Karen Kilross or Mary Greeley said that um, 
they tell their people they have they have two jobs to do. Every person has two jobs. One is to do their work, and the other job is to improve their work. And so the question is, how much people, how much time should people set aside to improve their work? It depends. I'll take the first step of that. I think it depends on your role in the organization. So um, your if you, if you would if you would ask that question to, to Mr. Amai, he would say that if you're a frontline worker, you should spend a very much smaller um, period of time improving your work in um, ratio compared to a middle line manager, um, compared to an executive. And so um, he might say that a frontline person might spend five percent of their day improving their work. A middle manager might spend fifty percent of the day. Um, helping to improve the work, and, and an executive might spend you know twenty five percent of the day improving the work, and then seventy five percent of the day on strategic goals and in larger scale kind of concepts. Um, so I, that's how I would answer the question. Mark, you want to add to that? Yeah, um, it, it, it depends, and I think I, I, there's no exact number, but um, I'm reminded of something I heard Mike Rother say in a presentation online recently, uh, that in terms of back to this idea of developing habits and learning new ways of thinking, it's better to spend 15 minutes a day on improvement every day right. than it is to spend an hour once a week. So I think a lot of organizations say, okay, here's our hour-long meeting, as opposed to building in daily huddles or other time for daily practice, identifying problems understanding the current state, looking at potential solutions, going through different steps of that process. Um, so I would suggest starting small. I, I, one of my favorite examples, uh, you know, was inspired uh, the Transplant Institute at a big hospital system. The director told his staff, if, if he just picked a number. He said, if you spend 20 minutes a day working on improvement, no one will criticize you for that. Uh, yeah, at some point, we just need to make a choice to carve out time instead of saying, oh, we don't have time for improvement. It, it's a choice. So choose to make that time. Uh, easier said than done in some settings, perhaps. Right. But right. I, would, I would start small, do a little bit of time every day. And then as you free up time, maybe you can do more. Uh, but there's that balance. We've got the direct value adding work to do. We've got patients mm -hmm. to see. We've got parts to produce. And then there's that need to also improve. Right. We've all got two jobs. Mark, are there any other questions that, that came through so we don't have to keep flipping back and forth on our... Yeah, I mean, there's... Uh, I don't know if we can address this briefly. Here's one that says, I'm new to the Kinexus software. How is it different than a suggestion box? Um, do you want to you take a stab at that, Mark, or do you want me to... Yeah, go, ahead, go ahead, Greg. Yeah, so I like to... When I'm explaining Kinexus initially to someone that doesn't know um, anything about Kinexus or know anything about the topic, it's always best to describe things as completely black or white. And then as you gain more knowledge on a topic, you can kind of add the subtlety. So the black and white would simply be an electron, we call it the electronic suggestion box. The electronic suggestion box model says, um, Okay, give us your idea that is going to go to some committee or um, get voted on. It typically will um, be reviewed in you know 30 or 90 days, and it'll get a vote up or a vote down, and we'll implement the best. And so you end up with a scenario that might implement one out of every 200. We've actually seen numbers of one out of every 500 or one out of every 1,000 ideas not sustainable in our opinion. Um, people will stop engaging that system. So that's kind of the electronic suggestion box model. Now I, I know I'm completely oversimplifying it, but just for the purposes of answering the question. Whereas the Kinexus model um, would be based on put in a, um, um, an idea or an opportunity. Um, first of all, that, that person's already been coached a bit, right? The, the leadership has talked to them. There's an improvement methodology. So there's a frame of reference of what type of things do you want me to be thinking about, right? You can teach people what a non-value added step is, and you don't have to use the words non-value added step. You can just explain, hey, you ever this ever happens and you have to do all this extra stuff to make the real thing happen. Um, and then train them to, to put that and to capture it. And then that doesn't go to a committee, right? That's not going to some central repository. That's just going to their direct manager. 
And the direct manager now has been coached and, and understands the benefit of responding to that in 24 to 48 hours. And the response isn't just a vote up or a vote down. The response is to most of the time go back to the person that put it in and articulate the, the, the problem and, and really dive down and, and define that. And what we see when you do that process is that you end up with a, our customers have a 75 to 80% change rate across all the things that come in. So you can see that the vast difference in the, in the um, um, change rate of the improvements can really give insight to the fact that there's different processes going on. And because there are different processes going on, the, you know, the technologies to, to support those different processes are inherently very different. Um, and, and I think a lot of the problems you talked about, Greg, uh, are traditional paper suggestion box systems. I had somebody in a hospital once, and I love telling the story about how you know that box is where good ideas go to die because nobody opens the box. There's um, no visibility. There's no action. There's no feedback. Right. There's no response. And so along the lines of you know, don't automate a bad process. You know, I think the electronic suggestion boxes uh, are digitizing a bad process that's got a different underlying philosophy than Kaizen, which is Greg's roots. You can see the K-A-I on the banner back there. Kaizen, Masaki Mai's work is obviously a big influence on Greg and the approach that our customers are doing with Kinexus. We, uh, we don't have that classic electronic suggestion box functionality of everyone put in a ton of ideas and everyone can vote or the executives can pick two out of uh, a thousand ideas. That's, right. that's not how Kinexus works. And then at the, at the risk of getting kind of too feature focused here, um, you know, Kinexus also provides the ability to manage, you know, all that top down process improvement work as well. Um, and, um, and then sitting side by side, Kinexus provides the visibility into the, the, the metrics. The, what's the data you're trying to improve, whether you call them KPIs or your balance scorecard as well. So kind of seeing what's the data, what's the way we're improving it. And so, um, a lot of people, when they initially hear about what we do, um, say, oh, well, that's, that's just an electronic suggestion box, or oh, that's just a project management tool. And so we do have features that do both of those, but it's done in a, a style of continuous improvement. And because it's done in, in that style, it ends up creating a very different product and a very different set of solutions, um, as evidenced by, the, by the, the type of work that's done in the system. So we've probably got time for a couple of more. Um, I'll just paraphrase a couple that came in. Um, we had about three questions that came in talking about the, um, the fear of having too many ideas, of being mm -hmm. overwhelmed with, with ideas or opening the floodgates, if you will. So maybe talk about your experiences, whether you've seen that to be a real problem, and then uh, what, what organizations can do to maybe overcome that fear. I, I've got two quick points on that. One is, I think sometimes there's that big flood of ideas because we're asking everybody everywhere to submit ideas all at once instead of starting right. small, learning what works, coaching people, building capabilities, and moving along uh, from there. I think the second challenge is to ask, well, if we collected, if everyone in a department of 200 people had two ideas, had 400 ideas, why can't we implement them all right away? What's the assumption or the bottleneck? Sometimes the assumption is, well, the manager has to be involved in all of them. Well, no, if you, you spread out not just idea generation, but spread out the testing and implementation and evaluation of those ideas, that doesn't mean everyone work individually without communicating with their team. Or any supervision, right? But you spread out that implementation workload, and suddenly you're not afraid to collect so many problems because you're actually you are able to do something with them. I mean, to me, just to add to what Mark's saying, it's a matter of perspective, right? I mean, um, we definitely know that in our work with customers that there is an initial blip. I think that that initial blip and then kind of gets into a steady state is very easily managed by um, recognizing that the person submitted it. I think. It's not a recognition of a, oh, you're making the person feel listened to. I mean, genuinely say, I, I'm i listening to you. Um, we have uh, this amount of bandwidth. And so what we're going to do is actually we're just going to schedule that out 
to address that in 30 days or 45 days and to kind of level load a little bit. Um, and, and I think that's a little bit where prioritizing um, comes in. And some people use a pick chart, right? What's the, what's the effort? What's the benefit? And I, don't overcomplicate it. Just, just make sure you're responding to the person. Hey, we heard you. We're, this is our bandwidth. We're trying to increase our bandwidth. And then, um, and then like in Kinex, we have that, a feature. You just put it into plan and it can automatically kind of activate when you want or whatnot. But you can develop some sort of process that helps level load that initial blip. And one other final point, I think there's a balance between asking people, what do you want to change? What can you change? I'll yes. give Mike Rother credit for this idea because I heard him articulate this again recently. But what do we need to improve? So really, if there is a limited capability, you don't reject the ideas. You just say, okay, not now. And you prioritize in some way. And you maintain visibility to the prioritization. We haven't blown you off or rejected your idea. But because of the goals we need to reach, here's what we need to do this month, and now we'll, we'll do other stuff the next month. There's some fascinating research that Ethan Burris, a uh, professor at UT, is doing. He actually just presented at our user conference, um, well, you obviously know that, but to, to our listeners, um, where he, he, they were looking at data that showed um, what is the ramifications of when you submit an idea and then not respond to that versus um, never having asked for the idea to begin with. And there's actually more dissatisfaction at an organization if you ask for ideas and then don't respond to them than if you would have simply never asked at the beginning. So I think the key take home here is, is to, don't be afraid of the little blip that's gonna come in just simply respond to it, make sure you get back to that person, and, and then prioritize it in some way and schedule it to come back into, into the workflow at an appropriate time. Yeah, so to, yeah, to summarize it, I was thinking of uh, Professor Burris as well. Uh, if you're gonna ask people for their ideas, you better be ready to do something about it. Uh, it, it if you ask for ideas and then don't follow through, that hurts the morale and culture. So I think that's, that would be the argument for starting small. Demonstrate right. that you can do this in a department before you try to do it in a site, before you try to do it in the entire broader organization. You can't see my hands. <laughs> Prove you can do it here and then spread as opposed to trying to do it everywhere all at once. Great, perfect. So we, we've got about a minute left or okay. so. Why don't we take uh, anything, any last points that you would want to make, Greg? My last points were, are, is, where is our? Um, I thought this was a lot of fun. Um, we were blown away by the volume of questions that came in. It was Mark and I intentionally tried not to prep for the questions just so it would kind of be a free flow. This is what's on the top of our minds. And so when I asked him in our 30 minute kind of prep session, how many questions? And he was like, oh, you know, almost 30 questions came through. Um, I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> we're never going to be able to answer them all. So um, we're definitely going to be addressing all the questions. And also just let us know. We're going to be asking for your feedback. Let us know, was this, was this valuable content for you guys? We, that's the, our whole mission is to spread continuous improvement, and you are our customers, whether you're consuming our content or using our product. So let us know how we can best help you spread continuous improvement in your organization. Okay. Mark? Just want to thank everyone for their questions and like Greg said we'll, we're going to experiment with different ways of answering the questions that we haven't gotten to yet but everyone who submitted one with their uh, with that, your email addresses we will follow up with you very specifically to say hey we've answered your question and here's where you can find that answer great that kind of segues into the kind of the last um, slide just telling people maybe how you can get this information so just Expect a blog post from us. Expect a podcast from us. Uh, we'll also provide this in an email. So you should be able to, uh, to share this information if there are other people who would find it interesting. And then, Mark, maybe you could um, tell us a little bit about the next webinar. Yeah, so we are going to be, I'll be hosting a webinar on uh, December 10th. It's going to be actually at 2 p.m. Eastern, which is an hour later than we normally uh, do the webinars, but uh, Greg had mentioned Mary Greeley Medical Center from Iowa. 
Uh, Karen Kilrosser and Ron Smith are going to be presenting, talking about, you see the title here, how leadership commitment and a systematic approach is helping them succeed with daily improvement. So they have a lot of um, great lessons learned. Uh, Mary Greeley Medical Center um, won, uh, received recognition at the state level through uh, the Malcolm Aldridge Award process. Uh, Karen um, was recently given uh, an individual award by the uh, Iowa Lean Consortium, the Iowa Lean Collaborative. Uh, so they, and, and Ron, I, I've been able to work with, and Ron's been a great coach uh, to people throughout the organization. So they, they have, it's always great to see our customers shine. Yep. The, they they are so, true, true continuous improvement rock stars. Great. And then I think we let you know about uh, other resources if you like the content that you uh, that you see today. Uh, we keep a library of our webinars on our website. There's also um, our blog and our website and past webinars and our social media accounts. So we would invite you to engage us at Kinexus and ask questions and help us all to spread continuous improvement. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, everyone.